Okay, welcome back to our second lecture on BC 212, Christian Apologetics. And um, we've been talking about uh, Bible translation, especially uh, focusing, of course, on English versions of um, the Bible. And we're just trying to understand why there are so many different versions, and then, yeah, why do we see a uh, difference, sometimes serious differences, uh, in the English version? So we're coming, coming to that. Let me go ahead and share this little graphic, which is useful, very useful, for us to understand uh, different Bible translations. So. Overall, what we said was uh, the translators who are going to work on the translations, of course, they're going to focus, start with the original, which is the Hebrew, the Aramaic, and the Greek. They have to make certain decisions f to guide their translation process. They have to decide, you know, uh, especially when it comes to differences, a minor differences they see in the text. Are they going to go for the majority or are they going to go for the neutral uh, version? And in addition to that, they also have to make a decision on what is the overall philosophy behind them doing their work. Are they going to be close in word to the original text or are they attempting to produce something that is easier for the reader to put it in modern English, modern language are they going to communicate thought are they going to communicate meaning or are they going to be a paraphrase you know uh, just a brief almost like a summary of what was being said so based on this this little chart captures for us very nicely uh, you know where different English versions fall um, most of us uh, uh, so when you look at this you know we are very familiar with New King James that's something I've been using for a long time uh, I started off with the King James in the early days and then moved to New King James so these versions fall in the in this in this philosophy word for word so they try to stay word for word from the original text uh, now i'm slowly trying to move to nasb so uh, i'm trying to slowly uh, because um, the new american standard bible has come out with a 2020 version which is uh, not only word for word but it is also in contemporary English, so I thought that that's pretty good. So I'm, I'm I'm in the process of trying to move from NKJV to NASB. Right, that's that's kind of where I am uh, right now personally. Now, there's nothing wrong if you know you're using any of these other ver English ver versions of the English Bible. Uh, you find uh, uh, NIV is a very common one where many people do, do use. Uh, NIV, which is pretty common, but we have to keep in mind uh, that it falls in this category of thought for thought, which is fine, I'm not saying it's wrong, but some interpretation of the original text has already taken place by the translators. They have uh, attempted to say, or they have said, okay, this is what we think the writer was thinking, and so this is what we're communicating to you, so that you can try to think the same thing. So thought for thought. So the NIV falls here. It's very common, commonly used, and I'm not against it. It's just here. Uh, uh, another uh, common one that you would see is the Amplified Bible. And again, the Amplified Bible has um, a classic version, which was done earlier. Then they've redone uh, another one. So the, there's also a newer version of the Amplified Bible. And it's 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 and and you know the the advantage of the amplified Bible is they show you in parentheses 
uh, um, variations of the meaning of that original word and then sometimes they put the uh, box brackets where they also try to interpret further the word so that's why it's amplified it's got of it as an amplified bible but it it's kind of trying to help the reader saying this word means this but it could also mean you know these other things uh, uh, in in the english language so they're, they're trying to bring that out in that work now Many are familiar today with also the, uh, the Good News Bible, Good News Translation, the Living Bible, uh, and the Message Bible. Uh, so, but keep in mind, uh, these are more paraphrase versions. So they're trying to make it very simple, very easy, capture the essence of what was being said, not, it's not doing a word for word, thought for thought meaning, but put in simple words, for the reader, make it easy for the reader to get a sense of what was said. Now, this is where the problems happen. And uh, some of you may have already observed. If I take a verse from, let's say, uh, the New King James or the New American, put it alongside, especially one of these that are more paraphrased or equivalent versions, sometimes they, it's like these are two different things that are being said. You know, uh, so that's where it's it leaves us with a very uncomfortable feeling, uh, and I have to admit it is very uncomfortable uh, when you have something where, say, hey, this is what you know word for word text is saying, and here you have maybe the Living Bible, the Message, or even sometimes even the Good News Bible is saying something, but it's not really saying what you know the the word for word is saying. So that is a problem uh, uh, for us, um, and uh, but the motivation behind what the translators have attempted is in doing the paraphrase is try to make something easy for people to read. But in the process, you know. Uh, some of what was what is said is actually distanced from what the original text says. So I, I, I'm not saying we should completely disregard these things. No, I would say are these serve a purpose? The paraphrase version serve a purpose, and especially for those who, who you know, who, who's English, maybe uh, they want something easy to read. Uh, English may not be that great, or you know, so it's, it's a good introductory step for people. But if we want to study, really study the scriptures, we need to move more and more closer towards the left end, which is getting closer to the word for word and thought for thought. And so, therefore, for us students who are you know, you know, serious about studying, it would be good to look at translations of the Bible, the English version of the Bible that are word for word. But here's what I do, and I just share, I'll just i share this and then we'll pause for some questions. I, like, like I said, I, I've been using New King James Version for a long time, and I'm now slowly trying to move, my, migrate myself <laughs> to the New American Standard Bible 2020 version. Um, so I kind of spent a lot of my time here, but in studying, I also do read uh, translation versions that are in this entire range. And the reason I do that is to, because I feel doing that helps in communicating to modern or to current audience, to present day audience uh, in modern language. Uh, English language. So while I study here, I study in the word for word space. So I try to understand what was originally intended by the writer. Uh, and I look up the Hebrew and the Greek and I study here. But I also read uh, uh, what modern translations, versions say 
to get an idea of how to communicate that in modern language. And that is important because ultimately you're speaking to an audience. Um, they are, you know, they are they they're speaking uh, that the language, English language, being used, is different from, you know, the King James or the New King James. So we have to be able to communicate the original thought, or original word in, uh, in in modern language. And I find just reading other versions helps in that process. In just thinking through on how this is how I should say it uh, when I'm speaking, so I do that. But in studying and understanding truth um, and and gaining insight, I stay here in in the word for word area, mainly New King James, and now trying to move to New American Standard Bible 2020. Okay, so yeah, so kind of you know, just summarize some of these, you know, and you can see when all of these versions were done, uh, so on. Okay, so before we come to the final section here, let, let's see if there are any questions, anything people want to ask or discuss. Any questions? Everybody's, uh, everybody's got it, understand? Yeah, so in the process of doing the translations, um, the translation translators, will indicate you know and you will find this in the footnotes or in the middle section of various bibles saying you know this word uh, is or it was said like this in the majority text or it is said like this in the nu um section you know uh, versions um it is so they're basically telling you that look we have followed maybe the majority text but the oldest text would say this. So they're kind of getting it across to the reader. Uh, uh, or they may italicize the word, or they may give you the meaning of the word, and so on. So they're kind of trying to, they've done their work, but they're also trying to, uh, if there are any variations, they communicate that to the reader. Okay. Now understand that the, these variations are not, uh, you know, huge. They're not major, right? There are my, these are minor variations. The essence. If we get the essence of what is being said, uh, we live by that. We don't have to, you know, falter, struggle with it. It's pretty clear. Um, only, you know, what I would be careful of is these paraphrased versions because uh, they are done deliberately to make it simple and easy, but in the process, they are uh, far away from the original. So I would, you know, I would read them. But if you're going to seriously study, you want to study truth, stay close to the original text. Okay. Uh, the last final section is uh, just to affirm to us the uh, the the uh, the wonder of the Bible. Uh, there is unity across. The books, uh, so it's quite amazing, you know. The throughout the Bible, for example, example, the Triune God. In the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter one, there is one God, but He is introduced to us as a unity. You know, for when Moses writes there, God said, Let us make man in our image. The word us and our is not singular. And it's like if somebody wanted to, you know, try to just make up something and they say, Hey, you cannot put us, you cannot use us and our, and our for, for, for us, you know, for God. But he said, Let us make man in our image, you know, and in our likeness. So then, you go throughout the scripture, and, and the Bible brings out throughout the scripture a triune God. That is actually very difficult, and yet it's very interesting. It's very difficult because, you know, the Lord our God is one God, but he's God in three persons. And to capture that, and to capture that consistently through time, across from Genesis to Revelation, is something very amazing. 
And it was not done by one writer. These are 40 different authors who come from different backgrounds. And you know, some are highly educated, some are just plain, simple, ordinary people. And yet there is that consistency of one God, three persons, Trayu and God. Very, very different. And uh, you know, it, it has to speak to us about because that is very it's a very complex understanding, right? A triune God. And yet that is consistently maintained throughout this the Bible. And that itself is telling us, you know, God's hand was on these writers who are writing the scriptures to maintain that. And it wasn't like each one taught the other person, no. Um, it was the hand of God keeping that throughout. Because then uh, historical, archaeological information in many places are just consistent with what is actually found in historical records. Uh, so that's also very interesting. From a prophetic standpoint, again, the Bible is amazing because there are so many prophecies, things that were written well in advance, which were fulfilled uh, in you know time to come. And there are some amazing, astounding prophecies. You know, you think about uh, Isaiah calling by name uh, uh, a Persian king who was not even born. So Isaiah says, you know. He, he mentions Cyrus. He writes about Cyrus, and he says, you're, "You're the one who's going to do this." And Cyrus is not even born. He's a he's not even around. The Persian Empire is not even there. And then comes, you know, the fulfillment of that prophecy, which is amazing. I'm just I'm just mentioning one, but like that, there were so many things in the Bible spoken hundreds of years in advance and fulfilled in time. And mathematically, or uh, let me put it like this, humanly, it is impossible. You know, it's impossible. But it is, these prophecies have been fulfilled. And I think the most astounding would be that of Jesus Christ himself. That, uh, you know, when, when we put all the prophecies concerning Christ, there are about 300 of them concerning his first coming, and uh, for one man to fulfill even eight of these prophecies, for one human person to fulfill all eight, the probability is one in 10 to 17. Again, this was calculated by a uh, mathematics professor, Peter Stoner. And for one man to fulfill all 48 of these is one in 10 raised to 157, meaning this is, this is, Humanly not possible. It's not possible, humanly. We would just say it, it's impossible. And yet it did happen. And therefore it has to be a work of God. You know, for one person to fulfill all of these prophecies had to be God. So like this, you can point to many script uh, prophecies in the Bible and say, like, it's so amazing. Then like we mentioned earlier, it's indestructibility. People have tried to destroy it, not succeeded. It's focus on Jesus Christ. You see Jesus from Genesis to Revelation in the Bible. And Jesus pointed that out in John 5, 39. He says the scriptures are testifying of him, referring to the entire Old Testament scriptures. Jesus is seen there. Uh, the teachings of the Word of God, the Bible, are amazing. Uh, it is ancient, and yet it is timeless. Ancient means you're, you're talking, we're reading script, scripture that was written you know, more than two, 3,000 years ago. And yet it is so relevant to our day and time. And so that is amazing. And it transforms our lives. Somehow, all kinds of people, all kinds of background, they pick up the Bible, they read it. And the lives are so powerfully changed. And it's not a self-help book, you know. Here are the ten steps to, to a better life. It's not, you know, how to be a better person kind of book. No, it's it talk it talks about so many things. It's not written like a self-help book. It's not designed or written like a you know, be a better person book. 
it's it's scripture it's talking about god his dealings with man and so on and yet when you read the scriptures life has changed so that is also remarkable so you know it, it's amazing uh, this 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 section the last part is taken from the gideon's bible uh, you would find it in um, in almost every uh, gideon uh, um, um, New Testament. It's just very, very beautifully captured. You know, uh, this, this, the Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, uh, and so on. It's, it's just beautiful. I encourage you to read it. Uh, it's just a beautiful uh, writing about the Bible itself. Okay. So, so we 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 conclude this chapter uh, on uh, on the on the Bible. And uh, uh, any questions before we move to? We're now going to shift to another set of topics. So before we leave this, any questions about the Bible, its authenticity, its accuracy? Uh, you know, are you convinced? Are you, you know, are you convinced about the authenticity and the accuracy of the text of Scripture? Uh, and uh, you know, if people ask us questions, we should be able to explain to them in a very, in a very simple way. Look, this is why the Bible is so reliable. Uh, this is why uh, we are so confident about the Scripture text. And yes, you know, uh, there are these very versions uh, which seem like the Bible is contradictory, but there's a reason why these are so different, and therefore we encourage you to stay in this part of. Uh, you know, use these kind of translations, etc. We can explain to people. All good. Any questions? Okay. So now we're going to shift in our discussion to the person of Jesus Christ. So we talked about the Bible. Now we're going to shift to talking about the person of Jesus Christ. Now this is so important because. Somehow in the modern church, who Jesus Christ is has been compromised. Now I'm not saying everybody has done this. No, that's not that's not true. But in the modern church, in in, in order for us to be, you know, let's say, accommodating, welcoming, so on, uh, sometimes leaders in the church compromise on who Jesus Christ is. For example, in talking about the uniqueness of Christ, to say that Jesus Christ is the only Savior, there is no other Savior. Sometimes Christian leaders compromise on that. Because uh, you know, people will, will, will not welcome such statements today. How can you say that Jesus Christ is unique? You know, they're okay to accept him as, you know, one among many. But if you say Jesus Christ is unique and he's the only savior for mankind, that is not acceptable. And so that aspect is compromised then about his resurrection did he physically rise from the dead how can you say that and so sometimes they're willing to compromise on that so okay yeah maybe it was just a spiritual resurrection maybe it didn't happen really but that's okay so on so what we want to do in the next section is establish for ourselves the uniqueness of Christ, uh, his resurrection, and how do we present uh, Christ to the world? That there should not be any compromise on that, the person of Jesus Christ. And if we are convinced about the uniqueness of Christ, then we can. You know, affirm that when we are asked 
we don't have to compromise. We don't have to, you know, uh, say you know, comprom uh, say present Christ in a way that he really isn't. But rather we present Christ. This is who the Bible says Jesus Christ is. This is why we say it was a physical, bodily resurrection from the grave, and that he ascended physically to the Father. This is why we say that, and we uh, answer that. So we're going to shift uh, our uh, focus now to the person of Christ. Let me get started here, and uh, we will continue this uh, next week as well. We have quite a bit of ground to cover. I will I will move a little uh, I'm more fast uh, in this because um, uh, it is not something that's totally new for us. Uh, many of us are um, familiar with these things, but it's good to put it down in a way that we can understand it ourselves and also communicate it to others. Now, in some cases, in some cases, you will hear people make the statement, oh, Jesus was not a historical person. You know, um, and that's just, uh, it's, it's, it's not there. But actually, when they, uh, if you hear that kind of a statement, you and I must be sure that that is not true. Jesus Christ was a historical person. That means he actually lived in time physically. Okay, it's not just a mythology. It's not just something people made up. No. And there are at least 19 sources, independent sources, that refer to the person of Christ. And I've just mentioned a few here. Um, different historians who lived nearing that time or subsequently, they write about the person of Jesus Christ. I mean, talking, we're talking about within the first century AD, right, or close to that, that they mention Jesus Christ. So obviously, if he was just a mythology, if he was just a made-up figure, a fictitious person who never actually lived, uh, these historians, who, these are, you know, these are uh, independent historians. These historians would not have mentioned about Jesus, his early followers, and so on. So when somebody makes the assertion that, oh, Jesus Christ was not a historical person, no, they are wrong. We've got more than sufficient uh, historical evidence uh, to point to his, uh, uh, his, his presence in human history, right? So, uh, is, you know, we've got quotes here from Dr. Michael Grant, no serious scholars mentioned apostolate, the non-history of Jesus, or uh, uh, from... Uh, uh, Clifford Moore, Harvard professor, uh, Jesus was historical, not a mythical being, uh, not just something, uh, you know, uh, uh, made up here, but as a historical thing. Now, why is Christ unique? What makes Jesus completely, totally different from, you know, every other religious leader? Uh, other historical leaders or great teachers or so on and so forth. How, how do we look at it? How do we understand it? And then if somebody asks us, how do we communicate that? So we capture this in nine key statements and what Christ claimed for himself, what the Bible says about the deity of Christ, what the Bible says about the uniqueness of Christ, and then you look at the incarnation, virgin birth. We look at his life, work, and teaching and impact on history. We look at his sacrificial death. We point also to his resurrection. And we point also to salvation through faith. And we point to his power to transform, heal, deliver. And all of these are important. To different people, of course, different things may be, mean more or less, but all of these are important that establish the uniqueness of Christ. Okay? So let's quickly talk about that. So Jesus, now I, I know you've you have it, you had an entire course on Christology uh, in I think the first semester. You you know so you you know you did a complete study on the life and the 
person of Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and so some of these things are familiar ground. Um, but think about Christ's claim for himself. Right? As you read the Gospels, especially the Gospel of John, Jesus is so clear, so emphatic on who he is. You know, and in all of these statements, he's pointing out his uniqueness. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. Before Abraham was, I am. And we'll come back to that later. Uh, I'm the door of the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the true white. So he's saying, look, this is who I am. And all of these things are making him unique. He didn't say, I am one of the people who are lights in this world. I am the light of the world. Any man who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Hmm, powerful statement. You know, he could have said, well, I will, I will light up your life a little bit, or I, will, I am one of the people who will uh, uh, give you light, or, you know, uh, he could have positioned himself in a non-unique way. Uh, he could have put himself along with many others, but he, he set himself apart. And when he rose up from the dead, when he presents himself or reveals himself to John, he says, look, I was alive, I died, I'm alive forevermore. I have the authority of hell and death, or I'm Alpha and Omega, beginning and the ending. Now, who else could have claimed this? And he says, look, I am the root and the offspring of David. I am that one that was spoken of in the Old Testament will come of the line of David. So, you know, so Jesus, when he presented himself to his disciples, he just didn't classify himself, like we said, along with a long list of teachers and prophets. No, he set himself apart in his claims. And the most notable would be John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, those are strong words. In other words, he says, there's no other way to the Father. I am the only way. I am the only way. So either we accept that or we dispute that. There's no middle ground. He is, he said, I am the way to the Father. There's no other way. And do you want to accept it? Accept it. So, you know, uh, he, he, he made these statements. Think about another statement that really shocked the people. He said, Jesus said, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So, you know, he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And I said, like, hey, I was there when Abraham was there. <laughs> And then he used the phrase of God, I am, for himself. Before Abraham was, I am. Now, he's playing on those words. That means, I was there before Abraham, but also, I'm using the title of God for myself, I am. And both are true. I was there before Abraham, and I'm God, deity. And so the people were ready to stone him because, hey, how could you speak like that? Or think about what he said in John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. What did Jesus claim for himself? He claimed oneness with the Father, equality with the Father. Meaning he's saying, I'm God. He says, and that's why they were going to stone him. You make yourself God. So that's how they understood it. His audience understood this as he is saying he's God. I and my Father are 
one. Right? So, and we look at one more. In his high in John 17, when he was praying, in his prayer, he's saying, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with you before the world was. Now think about this. The glory which I had with you before the world was. That means I was there before the world. Everything was created. So this is not a small thing to say. Jesus is saying, I was there before every creation happened, was with the Father. And he's praying that. So you would look at all these claims of Christ, and you say, look, there's nobody else, no other man has ever made such claims. Nobody else uh, could even say that, say things what Jesus said. So the Christ claims for himself, put himself, put him, put him, puts him apart, sets him apart, different, unique. Secondly, uh, what the Bible states about Christ. The Bible presents Christ as God, who became man. Very simple. Now, the Bible doesn't present him as, he has a great prophet, he has a, he has a great teacher, he has a great philosopher. No, this is God who became man. Very clear. And, and we know these passages in John 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Hmm. The Word was God. Very clear. And the Word became flesh. So this same Word came on earth. So who is Jesus? The one who is God became man. Right? Philippians reiterates that. He was in the form of God, but he made himself of no reputation. That is, he came as a man. So he was there as God, in God form. He was God. And yet he came down in the form of man. And then we see several other scriptures. So what does the Bible say about Jesus? It says very clearly, this is God who became man. So today, when we present Christ to the world, we have to stay true to that teaching of the Bible. We cannot present Christ as you know in any other way. This is the Jesus of the Bible. What he claimed for himself, what the Bible claims about who he is. And Related to that, point number three is the Bible presents Christ as absolutely unique. So even the Bible doesn't say he is one among many. No, the Bible says he is the only. So we are familiar with these scriptures, Acts 4 12. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we could be saved. No other name. It's not like, okay, here, here, here's a name you can call. No, there's no other name you can call. <laughs> and it says there's one God, one mediator. There's one God, and there's one mediator, and that's Jesus Christ. So the Bible presents Christ as the only, the only Savior, the only mediator. Number four, why is Christ unique? Because of his incarnation and the virgin birth. Now think about this. In the incarnation, in the incarnation, this incarnation is God becoming man. So the Bible is presenting this man, Jesus, as God who became man, and also he was born of a virgin. Now, no other person has claimed this 
I am I am incarnate God who, became, who has become man, and I've been born in this manner, born of a virgin, the only one known as the incarnation and born of a virgin is Jesus Christ. Now we know that in, for example, in, uh, in Hinduism there are a lot of avatars which is parallel to our to our understanding of incarnation that means uh, God coming in in human form but then there's a huge difference between the incarnation and the person of Jesus Christ and avatars so what is it what is it now let's think of let's think through this logically uh, and not in any condemning way but in a differentiating way like let's differentiate this what what we find is on the one side there are so many avatars coming and we are saying there's so many avatars coming and who, which one of them ever succeeded in providing salvation and deliverance for the human race the fact that there was a need for so many avatars meant that each preceding avatar was not God, because God can never fail. But on the other hand, what the Bible is pointing us to is there's one incarnation, there's one God came to the earth one time, because that's all he needed. He just needed one attempt. He's God. He cannot fail. He's going to fulfill what he came to fulfill. And in that one incarnation, he completed everything he came to do. He, he provided salvation, he conquered the devil, he did everything. So just looking at it purely from a logical standpoint, the incarnation, the birth of Jesus Christ, makes complete sense. That is, God had to come just once, do the work, finish the work and there's no need for any more unlike having numerous avatars keep on coming and none of them succeeding in providing salvation so that's a big difference here the other important thing is um, the fact that Jesus Christ was I think yeah this um, we have to cover this. Um, the fact that Jesus Christ was God who became man, born of a virgin, sinless and perfect, positioned him and him alone to provide salvation. So this was God who became man. So it was not a man who ascended into some godlike state, but it was God who became man. So he was perfect to start with. He lived a perfect life. He was not subject to death, to sin, Satan, and death. And so he alone, as a man, could become a substitute for all of us to pay for our sin. So that itself positions Christ uniquely to be able to deliver mankind to redeem mankind okay so let me pause here uh, with the point number four we will complete the pick this up here point number five next week let me see if there are any thoughts and questions so far um everybody's with me so far any questions All good. Okay. Um, I think everybody's following. Um, yeah, I think we are understanding this. Let's take a moment just to mm, close in prayer. So we'll pick up from here next class, next week. Look at the uniqueness of Christ. Then we will talk about the resurrection of Christ. How can we establish the fact that Christ actually rose up from the grave? Uh, we will uh, cover that next week right and these pdfs have been put up on the classwork section so you can download it from there and just review it uh, for for your own study okay
Can somebody please close in prayer today? Um, then we will dismiss. Okay, who wants to pray? Go ahead, Elijah. Okay. Our Heavenly Father, we are most grateful once again to you for the beautiful grace that you have bestowed on us. We thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to be guided, Father, to study on this network. Father, we pray that you continue to grant us the grace mm -hmm. to be able to understand your word as we go through it, so that we will be able to defend our faith in any time that we are called upon father we pray that you grant us the grace to be able to present christ in it in his, in his uniqueness to the unsaved world that they may come to the knowledge of jesus in jesus mighty name we pray amen amen thank you everyone for being on the class today mm, have a good uh, take a break get ready for your next class have a good day have a great week i'll see you soon God bless. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Thank you.